everyone. Welcome to our online lecture about frames and machines. Now, I've been a bit busy while I've been home, so let's see. I think that frames is probably referring to the massive rise of Warby Parker, because frames are a very important part of your outfit. And I'm assuming that machines, in terms of Aeneas 102, is probably talking about the major film franchise, Terminator, or possibly Wally. Anyway, going off of this, the plan for today is to discuss machines and to answer the question, what is a machine? We'll do a brief introduction to pulleys, and we'll also discuss a variety of other machines as well. In terms of frames, we'll discuss what makes something a quote-unquote frame problem. And the answer to that is something that's called two-force members. We'll go into much more detail about how to identify those and how those make up what frame problems pretty much are. And last but not least, we will do some example problems. All right, let's start off with a brief introduction to machines. A lot of you may have a fear of machines based off of my Terminator thing, but ignore that and let's get back to some things that are around your house. A lot of you probably have scissors, and we all know, don't run with those, that's dangerous. But scissors are an example of a machine. You've probably got other tools like these, wrenches, pliers, laying around your house, and I'm sure that everybody has one of these things laying around their house as well. Actually, I have no idea what this is. It's a funky looking thing that I think is probably a nutcracker. But another example of a machine is the fulcrum, where uh, you put a lever on top and you can decrease the amount of force necessary to lift a heavier object. Essentially the goal of all of these machines here, and the definition of a machine, is a device that transmits or modifies force or motion. And essentially, machines usually are created such that our job as humans is easier in the task at hand. So. Let's do a brief introduction to pulleys, because these are ubiquitous and extremely important not only today, but throughout human history. Pulleys can do two things. The first thing they can do isn't particularly impressive, but it is still very useful. Essentially, what pulleys can do is they can redirect forces. So in this particular case here, you can see that this horse, or donkey, is moving horizontally, whereas the load that ultimately gets applied is we're trying to lift this box vertically up. So pulleys can redirect forces. They can turn a horizontal force into a vertical force. And in this particular example, that's pretty useful because we can use the power of the horse to lift up a heavy object that humans wouldn't otherwise be able to lift up. Secondly, pulleys can magnify forces. And the idea there is that we wanna take maybe a really heavy box, like this one right here, And we want to be able to do less work than that box actually weighs so that it's easier on our side to pull that box down. Or sorry, to lift that box up. So, how do pulleys work? The magic way of pulleys really is to magnify forces. And the first thing you really have to look at in this particular case is to look at the rope. So here you can see that we've got one continuous rope going throughout this problem. And the key to this is really that the rope is fixed at the top. Now, what this essentially allows us to do, if we get rid of our drawing now, is we can pretty much analyze this as a statics problem to see why pulleys are so good. First thing we'll do is we'll make a cut through the ropes at the bottom. And when we do this and we look downward, what we'll see is the following picture. We'll see the weight and we'll see two cables going up. Well, we know that if the weight of the box going down is W, then the force in each of the two cables has to be W over two. And because we know that the tension is the same throughout the entire rope, that means that the force over on the left side that the person has to apply to lift this box is W over two. This essentially tells us that the pulley made it easier for us to lift the box, and it did so by a factor of two. We only needed half of the force and that makes us smiley face happy inside. Now, there is a trade-off with pulleys. When you're looking at pulleys, 
although you only need to apply half the force to lift the load, you have to pull it twice as far. So it's not a perfect system. So this comes from the work energy theorem. We know that the conservation of energy says that the energy put into the system has to equal the energy put out, or the energy initial equals the energy final. In our particular case, we'll be putting work into the system so as to increase the potential energy of an object that we're lifting upward. We know that work is force times distance, and the potential energy that our object is gaining is mgh. If we look in this particular case, the force that we have to apply in our last example was half the weight, or mg over 2. The distance that we have to move that would be a distance of h. If we go over to the other side, the box we're lifting has a weight mg, and will only be lifted a height of h over 2. So here's you, where you can see the trade-off of pulleys. The idea is essentially we get this benefit of our force is half as much, but the downside is that we have to apply twice as much distance to be able to get um, the object lifted. So let's look at another more complicated example for pulleys. So if we wanted to solve for the force necessary that a person would need to apply to lift the, mat, the weight W in this particular example, how would we do that? The first thing to do would be to identify where is the pulley fixed. So we can see that the pulley rope here is fixed to that particular uh, disc. So as a result, the next thing we want to do is we want to make a cut through the ropes. And we'll make a cut right here. If we make a cut right through there, then essentially what we can see is we have the following picture. And now we need to draw a free body diagram. We need to replace each of the ropes with a tension, and we need to draw the weight of the object, which we do right here. Now we can use our statics, sum of the forces in the y equation, and say that in this particular case, the sum of the forces in the y is equal to 4p minus w. And we know that this equation must be zero. So if this is the case, Solving for this equation, we determine that the force the person must apply to lift this box is P equal to W over 4. That's pretty good. The person is applying one-fourth of the weight to lift that box up. But remember, the person will have to pull it four times as far to be able to get uh, the height that they need. The other thing we can talk about with machines is the idea that a machine will mechanic, uh, apply a mechanical advantage or give you a benefit to the system. And the way to mathematically compute this is to compute the output that you're doing divided by the input. So in this particular example, we get a mechanical advantage of 4 because the mechanical output that we're doing, we're lifting a block that is mass or weight W, and we're applying a force of W over 4. W divided by W over 4 is 4, and this gives us the mechanical advantage of the system. Now I'll give you the chance to practice. We just did question A, but I want you to look closely at questions B and C and solve for the applied force P necessary to lift the weight in terms of W. So I'll give you a minute as the question hand falls down to the bottom of the screen to solve this. All right, if you haven't yet figured it out and you want some more time, pause the video for a minute, because now we're going to move on and I'm going to go over the answers. As we did in our last question, the first thing we wanted to do was identify where the pulley is fixed. So when we do that, we can see the pulleys are fixed in the following spots. This leads us to the answers for our questions. The first one, we had W over 4, and the next two, we have W over 3 and W over 9, respectively. 
Now you might be wondering why is the second one w over 3? The reason why the second one is w over 3, well, we'll show you. Essentially what we can see is that if we make a cut right here, we would actually see three tensions pulling up on our block. Those three tensions would be right here, right here in the middle, and the force P that we're applying. So as a result of that, we get that W over 3 is the force applied necessary to lift that up. And really the distinction here is that this P is lifting up, which is the direction of our weight. So that's helping. Question A was a little bit different because the P was pulling down, which was the opposite of the motion of our box. So that causes, the, that's why essentially that one doesn't count in our first question. So let's erase these marks right here. And let's look at the third example, C. Now why is that one P equals W over 9? The reason why is because if we look at this one, if you look pretty closely at this piece right here, what you could see is that that is actually the exact same as this. So not only that, but the bigger piece over here, which I'll change color so we can see it, is actually the same as well. As a result, we essentially have w over 3 in the top and w over 3 in the bottom. These multiply together to get us w over 9. And ultimately, the mechanical advantage of each of these systems is going to be 4, 3, and 9, respectively. Now that'll be all that I talk about for pulleys. But I encourage you to watch this really cool video of this guy from this YouTube channel called Smarter Every Day. This guy actually does some cool experiments to explain pulleys a little bit more, and I imagine that this might help you visualize and understand the concepts that we just talked about. Alright, now that we've talked about pulleys, let's talk about frames. And fundamentally, the thing that makes a problem a frame problem is a two-force member. So let's discuss that in greater detail. So, two force members are not something that's new to you. It's actually something we've been working with. On the exam two content, we actually talked about trusses. And actually trusses are filled with two force members. So the definition of a two force member is that it has to be pinned connections at both ends. And by that, we know that a truss has tons of pinned connections. It's got pin A, pin B, pin C, pin D, and pin E. And usually in truss problems, the loads are only ever applied at the joints. So a load might have been applied at B. Or we might have had reaction forces at point A due to a pin or something or other. And essentially, truss members were always in compression or tension. That is exactly what a two-force member is. A two-force member is essentially a component of a structure whose force is applied only along the direction of that member. And that's exactly what trusses are. Now, had we had something that looked like this on our truss, this would have violated the two force member rules. And as a result, this force would have made member BD at the top not a two force member because essentially our truss would have not had the loads applied only at the joints. The load would have been applied in the middle in this case, and we still could have solved for everything, but member BD would not be in compression or tension, it would actually be in something called bending. So a two force member, as we said, is a pin connection at both ends, and it has the loads applied only at the joints. Essentially what this allows us to do is that anytime we have a member now with these two constraints met, we know then that the force is going to be applied only along in the direction of that member. So here you can see at pin A and pin B we draw a force that's called FA. And this has only one force. And the shape below that's an L bracket 
what we can see is that it's pinned at both ends and there's no external loads. Therefore, the force that we draw at point A and B is again FA and it points inward or outward from the joints. The same thing would be true for this U-shape arch down at the bottom. The force would be directed from one pin to the other pin. And the exact same thing can be seen again in these examples over here, that the force from one pin to the other always has to be pointing in or out towards each other. And essentially a frame or machine is comprised of one or more, sometimes none, but usually one or more of these two force members. Now why do we have to use two force members to solve? Now in the olden days of Aeneas 102, whenever we saw a pin, we would say, ah, a pin. That must mean we have to draw X and Y reaction forces, BX and BY, and AX and AY. But if we were looking to solve for AX, AY, BX, and BY, we would get ourselves pretty darn confused because we would write a sum of the forces in the X equation with two unknowns. We would write a sum of the forces in the Y equation with two unknowns. We might try and do some of the moments to figure things out, but really, no matter how hard we try, we would never be able to solve this, because at the end of the day, we would have four unknowns, but only three equations. So we'd be pretty stuck. However, something we can kind of realize is that because we have AX and BX and AY and BY, if this member is to be stationary, which is the point of statics, we should be able to ascertain that AX must equal BX and that AY must equal BY. Now what does this kind of mean? Essentially what this means is that if we shift AY over and we were to do the same to BY, we would actually see that the force of these things here would either point inward or outward towards each other. And we would replace the forces AX, AY and BX, BY with one single force called AB. This is exactly what we were just describing a second ago. And the benefit of this is that on this beam, we just took four unknown forces and replaced it with one single force AB. That's awesome, because in the future when we do frame problems, it's gonna be very important to always first step check whether or not there are any two force members so that we can determine uh, if we can make our problem easier to solve. So let's give this some practice. Let's look at the following example frame problems and a machine at the very end, some pliers or shear cutters. And let's figure out which ones have two force members and what the member is that is a two force member in each of these questions. Use our rules at the top, which suggest that two force members have to be pinned connections at both ends and there's no external load applied to that member. Now I'll give you a minute or so to try and solve and identify the two force members in each of these three examples. All right, if you haven't yet finished, pause the video and give your second or yourself a little bit more time to think. Otherwise, I'm gonna go through the solutions. So for part one, what we can see is our two force member is member BC. The reason that member BC is, is because it's pinned connection at both ends, a pin at B and a pin at C, and there are no loads applied anywhere to that beam. 
If we look at the top member, AB, sure, we have a pin at A and a pin at B. However, we have a force applied to P that is away from the pins. Therefore, AB is not a two-force member. If we look at our second example, we can see at the top we have ABC. Well, right there, we have a pin at A and a pin at B, so there's pin connections. However, there's not a load applied only at the joints. The load is applied at point C, which is at the end. Therefore, our top piece is not a two-force member. But if we look at member BD, that has two pins, B and D, and there are no loads applied anywhere in the middle of that beam except at the pins. Therefore, member BD is a two-force member. If we look at our third example, what we can see at the top is we have a lot of stuff going on. We've got at the bottom CD and a force G. Well, that's two things that are pins, but the force is applied at the bottom. If we look at our top piece, our top piece, this is actually a little bit tricky to see, but the top piece right here is actually connected to this bottom piece right here. This piece here is essentially ABF. And as a result, we've got forces on both ends from this little twig and also this force F right here. Therefore, that's not a zero force member. If we look, we've also got this other piece here, the top piece, and that's pinned at B and E. However, there's an external force applied, again, by this stick that's in the cutting shears. So that's not a zero force member. The only thing that we can see that is a two zero force member is actually member DE because that's pinned at both ends, D and E, and there are no loads except at those points. So that is our zero force member. Sorry, two force member. And that's it. That's how you identify two force members in frame problems. And now what we'll do is we'll go through an example to show you how this works. Now what we'll do is go through two example frame problems and one example machine problem, which all have very similar and common elements throughout them. The first problem that we'll do by hand is this problem here. Essentially, this is a frame problem with three components, A, B, B, C, and C, D, and we're asked to solve for the reactions at point D. I'll show you by hand, but eventually what we'll arrive at is the following answers. Additionally, we'll look at this question here, which is an old exam problem. And what this particular problem does is it actually introduces a new thing to look at, which as you can see is the pulley held up by pin D. We'll look at how to analyze that problem, but what you'll realize throughout all frame problems is the common element is that step number one is always to identify the two force members. All right. We're going to look here at this fairly straightforward uh, frame problem. Now, the question asks us to determine the components of the reaction at point D. At point D, we can see we have a fixed support. So at point D, we're going to have a dy component, a dx component, and a moment at D. So essentially, the question asks us to solve for those three things. Given that P1 is 12 kilonewtons, so that's this force right here, and that P2 is 15 kilonewtons, which is this force right here. Now, step one in any frame problem is to identify any two force members, which I'll just call TFM. So remember that a two force member has to have two conditions. Condition one is that it's pinned, pin at both ends, and that two. There's loads only at the pin. So if we look here, member AB has two pins and has no loads other than the loads by the pin at A and the pin at B. Therefore, member AB is a two force member. Let's check BC. BC meets condition one. It's pin pin. However, it has loads away from the pins. Therefore, BC is not a two force member. And if we look at CD, 
CD is not going to be a two-force member because it has only one pin and a fixed support at the other side. So essentially, step one, identifying any two-force members, we've determined that AB is a two-force member. Given that AB is a two-force member, this is going to tell us that essentially AB has only one unknown force in it, which is directed along itself. Now, if we're looking at this right here, we can kind of guess that this member here is in compression. Because if we're pushing down here, this is going to be getting squished. So that'll come into play next. So essentially what we need to do is we don't need to draw a free body diagram for AB because it's a two force member. It's not really going to bring us any new information. What we do need to do is draw a free body diagram of member BC and member CD. And I'm going to pause the video and do that right now. All right, so now what you can see is I drew the free body diagram of member BC and I drew the free body diagram of member CD. Let's look at the free body diagram right here. What we can see, whoops, what we can see of this free body diagram is that AB, because it was in compression, is going to be pushing into node B to prevent getting squished. And we can see from over here that it was three wide by four tall. Therefore, we have a three, four, five triangle is the direction of AB. We've got three meters, three meters, and three meters here. We've got load P1, load P2, and we've got ourselves CX and CY. I've drawn CX to the left to be fighting the right push of AB, and I've drawn CY up because I'm assuming that these two forces here are going to be pushed back by CY and AB's vertical Y component. I've drawn my XY axes, and what I've done is I've also drawn the free better diagram of this piece over here, CD. So when we draw the free body diagram of that, we've got point D down here, which is a fixed support. And so we've got DX, DY, and MD. And we've actually got CX and CY up here. Now here's something you can see in frames. And this goes back to Newton's third law, which is that uh, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Up here, you can imagine that if AB is pushing to the left and up, CX would have to push to the left and probably be pushing up as well. But that's on this piece. What this piece over here feels, CD, CD feels beam BC pushing down on it, which is why we show CY squishing member CD, and we also show that this member is pushing point C this way to the right as well, and that's why we've drawn CX here. So you can see, similar to kind of what we do with trusses, CY will be drawn down here and CX will be flipped going to the right in this particular picture here. Now we have all the information that we need to solve the problem. And we'll start with this free body diagram right here because what we can do is a sum of the moments, solve for AB, then we'll be able to get CX and CY and using CX and CY, we'll be able to come down here and solve for the three things that the question had originally asked us for, which are the reactions at point D. So let's get started. The first step that we want to do is we want to sum our moments about point C. We want to set that equal to zero. So doing that, we will have the Y component of AB, which is negative AB times four over five times its distance away from point C, three, six, nine. And we say that this is negative because this would cause this piece to rotate clockwise. Then what we're going to have is we're going to have plus P1 times 6, because that's going to be going counterclockwise, and then we have plus P2 times 3. So this is our sum of the moments about point C equation, and given that P1 is 12 and P2 is 15, we can plug those values in here, and what we come away from from this moment equation is that AB is equal to 16.25 kilonewtons. And we get a positive answer, which indicates that our arrow we drew initially was correct. So now we have AB, we can do some of the forces in the X and the Y on this whole piece to get CX and CY. So let's do that. So we say some of the forces in the X is equal to zero, is going to be equal to three fifths AB, which is going to the right, minus CX. 
what this tells us here is that CX is equal to 9.75 kilonewtons. And when we do the sum of the forces in the Y direction, we can set that equal to zero as well. That will get us four-fifths AB minus P1 and P2, which we'll say are minus 12 and minus 15, plus CY. We know everything in this equation, so now we just say that CY is equal to 14 kilonewtons. Now we can come over here to this free body diagram, plug the numbers that we have for CX and CY in, and solve for DX, DY, and MD. So let's do that. So we do the sum of the forces in the X direction. And we set that equal to zero. This tells us that CX minus DX equals zero. Therefore, CX and DX are going to be the same, and therefore DX will be going to the left and be equal to a value of 9.75 kilonewtons. Pretty straightforward right there. Next thing we do is the sum of the forces in the Y. Again, you'll see a very similar result here, which is going to be negative CY plus DY is equal to zero. So DY is going to be equal to CY, which is equal to 14 kilonewtons. And last but not least, we do a sum of the moments about point D. We set that equal to zero. And that is going to be equal to negative CX times four. It's the one thing I forgot my free body diagram over here was this four meters of height. So we have negative CX times four plus MD. Now we say that this is negative because that's causing things to rotate clockwise. I drew MD going counterclockwise in my diagram up there. So what we get for MD is we get the MD is equal to 39 kilonewtons times meters. And there you go. That's how we did this fairly straightforward frame problem. The other thing that you could have in theory done is look at the whole structure as an entire piece. And let me draw what that would look like and I'll show you. So the alternative solution you could have done for MD is you could have looked at the whole system. If you look at the whole system, we can replace the pin over here A, because we know it's a two force member, with a single force AB. We would still have P1 and P2 and we would still have all of our reaction forces down here. As long as we know AB, which we would have had to solve for using this right here, we could have skipped this free body diagram and instead drawn this free body diagram of the whole system. Had we done this, we would have summed our moments about D. We would have had negative AB times 4 fifths, the Y component of AB times 12 in this case, because it's all the way away from D now, plus P1 times 6, because that's 6 away from point D, plus P2 times 3, plus MD. As long as we knew AB, we can solve for MD and we would get the exact same thing. And essentially we could set up the sum of the forces in the X and the Y equations again. And effectively we would get the exact same answers for DX and DY. So essentially step one is follow this path here no matter what. And then step two was either to go through here or to go to this free body diagram to solve for everything else. And that's it. That's how we do this frame problem. All right, now let's look at this other frame problem here. So this is like an old exam problem, pretty much. And what it says is that the frame is used to support a load of sand that weighs 70 pounds. So here's our load of sand, and we're told that this weighs 70 pounds. The sand hangs from a cable that passes around a frictionless pulley radius of 0 0.5 feet, that's going to be important later, at point D, and is anchored to the wall over here. We're told the structure is rigidly attached to the wall at point C, so we've got a rigid support right here. And we have the pin connections exist at A, B, D, and E, so everything else is held together with pins. The two questions that were asked is to find the reactions at C and the tension in the cable. So we're basically looking at what's going on right here and what's the tension in this cable. Second thing, part B, says determine the forces at A and the forces in link BE. So we're told to solve for 
what's going on right here, and what are the forces at A? So, remember, the first thing we want to do in any frame problem is we want to identify any two force members. And maybe I'll do that up here. So step number one, do we have any two force members in our question? Well, again, the two conditions we have for a two force member is one, it's pinned at both ends, and two, that the loads are only at the pin. Now in this question, do we have any two force members? Well, let's look. Member A, B, C. Well, it has two pins, but point C is a fixed support, so that would violate number two. So that's out of the question. Member A, D, E. Well, guess what? That's not a two force member either because we just said three letters. So there's three pins. So that's not a two force member. The last and only possible thing would be member B, E. It satisfies the first box, it's pin and pin. And guess what? There's no forces anywhere else on that member. So step number one does reveal a two force member to us and it tells us that member B, E is a two force member. So, how does this help us? This pretty much helps us because we don't really need to draw a free body diagram of point BE anymore. That's just going to be a waste of time. It's just going to essentially be an arrow pointing in towards each other. We're not going to use that free body diagram to solve. So now what we need to do is we need to draw a free body diagram of member ABC and ADE. And I'm going to pause the video as I draw that. All right, so what I've done is I've drawn a free body diagram of this piece right here, ADE. Now, if we look at ADE, we've got point A, point E, and point D right here in the middle, which is where the pulley is attached. Now, there's two ways you can handle pulleys, and I'll discuss this in the slides after this. But just look at the way that I did things right now. Essentially, at point A, we have a pin, and it's not a two-force member, so we have AX and AY. I've assumed a direction going to the right and a direction going up. This pulley has two things. It has a tension going down and a tension going to the right over here. The tension does both things. And at point E, we've said that member BE is a two force member. Therefore, I just draw force BE acting straight up. Now, where do all these distances come from? Well, what we can see is that from point A to point D horizontally, we have two feet. And from point D to point E horizontally, we also have two feet. That's where these two feet come from. Now, what we need to highlight here is that the radius of our pulley is 0 0.5 feet. Because of that, essentially what we know is that this distance right here is 0 0.5. And if that distance there is 0 0.5, that means we have 1.5 feet from point A to our tension. And the other thing we can kind of see is that vertically from B to E, we have three feet. Since this is symmetrical in the middle right here, it must also be symmetrical in the vertical direction. Therefore, from the ground, or from point A to point D, we have 1.5 feet. Because the radius of our pulley is 0.5, from point A to where our tension is acting over here is two feet. And last but not least, we know that the whole height from A to E is three feet. So now what the heck do we do over here? Well, the things we know are that the tension, if we looked right here, and we just made a cut, and we looked down, what could we say? What well, we could say that the tension in the cable is equal to 70 pounds. Pretty straightforward. Now, what we can do, if we know tension, we don't know BE, and we don't know AX and AY. So this looks like a classic situation where we can use some of the moments to solve for BE. So let's sum our moments about point A, and we'll set that equal to zero, and we'll now do the following. We'll say negative 70 times 1.5, because this tension here is 1.5 away and would be going clockwise, so we have negative 70 times 1.5, 
we have another tension that's going to cause a negative moment because this tension here would be going this way clockwise again around point A. So we have another negative 70 times 2. And last but not least we have BE going counterclockwise moment times 4. So we say plus BE times 4. So what all of this leads us to is the fact that member BE is equal to 61.25 pounds. And this is something that we were asked to solve for, and we just did, so we box our answer. Cool. All right, now what can we do? Well, now that we know the tension and BE, what we can do is the sum of the forces in the X and the Y on this piece right here, and we can solve as well. So now we'll do some of the forces in the x direction. We'll set that equal to zero. We'll say that that's going to be equal to ax to the right plus tension. Uh-oh. What you can see is going to happen here is that for ax, we are going to get negative 70 pounds. All this means is that our arrow was drawn the wrong way. But we don't want to change it because we don't want to get ourselves confused when we draw our next free body diagram. So we'll just say that AX is equal to negative 70, and that's totally fine with us. And we'll move on to the next step. So we circle this because this was something we also were asked to solve for right here. And now we do some of the forces in the Y direction, and we set that equal to zero. That's going to be equal to AY minus T plus BE. We know all of those things. This is 70. This is 61.25. Therefore, AY is equal to 8.75 pounds. Now, we've solved this problem a little bit backwards in a way, because what we've done effectively is we've solved part B before we've done part A. But there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. What we're going to do now is we're going to go back and solve for the things in part A, by now drawing a free body diagram of the piece that contains C, which is this bottom piece right here. I'm going to again pause the video and draw the free body diagram for that so we can move on with our solution. Okay, now I've drawn the free body diagram of the bottom piece, ABC. What we can see is that using Newton's third law, I've drawn AX to the left and AY down because over here, AX was going to the right and up. I've done the opposite. Now, I'm going to keep it this way just because from before I have AX equals negative 70. So I'm going to keep everything true from my free body diagram here and assume it follows through here. What you'll see is that I'll be able to plug in AX equals negative 70 using everything up here and still get all of the right answers. So what do we do? If we look here, we've got one, two forces in the X direction, two forces in the Y direction, sorry, three forces in the Y direction, a, Y, B, E, and C, Y, and a moment. So the first thing we're going to do, since we have two X forces, is we'll just get that out of the way. So we sum the forces in the X direction, we set that equal to zero, and that's going to get us negative A, X, because we've drawn A, X going to the left, minus C, X, because I also have C, X going to the left. Now what's going to happen here is that we would move C, X to the other side, we would get that CX equals negative AX. If we plug in negative 70 pounds, we'll essentially get that CX is equal to negative times negative 70 pounds. So what this tells us is that CX is equal to 70 pounds and it's going to the left. Because AX should have been drawn to the left, that means AX would have been to the right in this particular case. If AX had been going to the right, then CX would be going to the left as we expect. But as you can see, these negatives more or less work themselves out and we get that CX is equal to 70 pounds positive to the left. Next thing we do is we say the sum of the forces in the Y, we set that equal to zero. So we have negative AY minus BE. And again, we were assuming over here that BE is in compression. It's getting squished. So if it's getting squished, it would be pushing back 
at point E, and it would be pushing down on point B as well. And that's why we've drawn BE going down here. So we have negative AY minus BE plus CY all equal to zero. We know everything here except CY. So when we solve for CY, we get that CY is equal to 70 pounds. Essentially, it's just 8.75 plus 61.25 up here. So we get CY 70 pounds. And that's also positive, so it's going up. Last step is we do the sum of the moments about point C. We set that equal to zero. And that's going to get us AY times seven. It's positive because it's going counterclockwise. plus BE times 3, also counterclockwise, plus MC, because I've drawn MC going counterclockwise here. So when you get this, you'll get that MC is equal to negative 245 pounds foot, So essentially, MC is equal to 245 pound foot clockwise. And that's it. That's how we did this frame problem. Again, the steps that we followed, pretty straightforward, and the same for every frame problem is, number one, identify any two-force members. From that, we determined that PE was a two-force member. And essentially, that leaves us only two pieces to draw a free body diagram for. This piece right here, and this piece right here. The reason I started over here was because we had AX and AY, which were two unknowns, but everything else was known. So I started on the piece with the fewest unknowns. Because if I had looked over here, AX and AY were unknown, CX, CY, MC were unknown, and BE was unknown. I would have known absolutely nothing in this piece right here, so I would have known, uh-oh, I have to go here first so that I can work my way back over to here. And that's this problem. There is one alternative way that you could do this, and I'll show you that right now. Essentially, what you could have done for this problem as well, is you could have quickly solved for the reactions at C by looking at the whole structure's free body diagram. And the way to do this, essentially, would be to be making a cut, almost, right here. By making a cut right here and looking to the left, what we would see is the following free body diagram down here. The only external forces we would see would be the tension. And we would see CX, CY, and MC. So fairly quickly, what we actually could have done was we could have done the sum of the forces in the X. We would have seen that the tension, given that it's 70 pounds, that CX must go to the left and be 70 pounds. We could have also seen that CY must go up to fight this tension and also be 70 pounds, in which these match our answers from before. And we could have also done the sum of the moments about C, which in this case right here, I drew C clockwise. So I had negative MC minus 70, which is this force right here, times two, because that would be going clockwise around point C plus 70 times 5.5, which essentially comes from the fact that we've got three, two, and then another half a foot for the radius of our uh, pulley wheel. So we have plus 70 times 5.5, which again, you'd get MC is equal to 245 pound foot. There you go. That's how you could have solved for all the reaction forces at C by looking at the whole thing. And then effectively what you could have done is you probably could have used that fact gone back over to here, and now it wouldn't have mattered really which order you went. You could have gone over to here and solved for AX and AY, but then again, you would have needed to come back over here to solve for this. So probably what you would have done is you would have done this step right here, solve for the reactions at C. Then what you could have done was you could have come to this free body diagram right here, and solve for AX, AY, and BE. That way you could have done part A first and then part B second.
there you go. That's how you do this and usually most other frame problems with a very similar approach. All right, if you just watched my handwritten solution for the last two frame problems, you'll realize that all frame problems have very common solution sets. Essentially, most frame problems, the first step that you want to do is to, number one, identify any two force members. We did this for both the first and the second problem. And in this particular case, we identified that member BE was a two force member. This allowed us to arrive at a solution that was a lot simpler because it simplified our free body diagrams and the path to the solution. Now, as I explained to you in my handwritten solution, there's actually two ways that you could go about solving this problem by looking at the pulley. Now, in this particular case, something you can see, and that's different than the first frame problem we did, is that we have this pulley string right here. Now, the question becomes, how do we treat this pulley string in the problem? And I find that oftentimes people get a little bit confused by how this works. Heck, even I was confused the first time I saw a problem like this. Essentially, you have two options. Option number one is to draw the free body diagram as you see over here on the left. Sorry, on the right. And what that allows you to do is pretty much just keep everything the same. You can see that we've still got our pulley. It's supported by pin D. And we just draw the rope where it is in our particular problem. The thing to remember is we have to make sure that the dimensions we're using for the pulley string are accurate. And essentially, when you look at my handwritten solution, the way that I solved this problem was to do a sum of the moments about A to solve for BE. This involved the tension Y component and the tension X component together. And ultimately, that allowed us to solve for BE and then the rest of the problem. Well, how else could you do this problem? Option two, is essentially you would draw two free body diagrams. If you don't feel particularly comfortable leaving the pulley on there, you can replace it with two other forces, which would be, in this particular case, dx and dy. Now, where do these forces come from? Essentially, you draw the pulley disc itself and you draw the tensions. The tensions are being applied to this disc and the disc is being held up by the pin D in this particular case. So what you see is a very simple sum of the forces in the X and the Y equation down below that leads you to the fact that DX is equal to 70 pounds and DY is equal to 70 pounds. What you can then do is redraw the free body diagram like we just had on the previous slide and essentially replace the tensions that we had with these new DX and DY. So what you can see now has happened is that we now have dx and dy on our free body diagram of ADE rather than the tensions. And as you can see, due to Newton's third law, dx is facing to the right and dy is facing down. If you then look at the sum of the moments in the A, you can realize that the equation becomes 70 times 1.5 minus 70 times 2 plus BE times 4. And if we go back really quickly, you can realize that the equation we had on the previous slide was negative 70 times 1.5 minus 70 times 2. So ultimately, the equations you arrive at for both of these particular examples are the same. So because the equations are the same, I recommend that you approach using the pulley in the problem however you feel most comfortable doing so, because either way, you're going to be just fine.